Great. So let me just bring this up. So if you saw my poster already, or if you haven't, um, uh, Andy and, and uh, Simon mentioned that we've done a major update to the uh, Pint Paleo Intensity Database. Um, we now include data up published through 2019. So that now includes 4 billion years of, of paleo intensity. Uh, it's really a, a, an impressive data set because it's really this giant community effort. There's over 290 studies that have been included. And um, we now have a new website, which I encourage you to check out. Um, and one of the, the, the big accomplishments of this is that we've now fully integrated the sort of QPI quality of paleo intensity um, assessments into the database. You can go on the website, you can search by QPI score or a particular criterion that you're interested in to try to refine your data set. If you are already a Pint user, I would just caution you a little bit that we have changed how we index the data and we've added some new columns or changed the columns. So just kind of give it a look. Don't just download the, um, the text file and run away with it. And if you have data that you think we missed, or you have a new paper you'd like to add. I am already starting to compile um, an update to capture the last couple of years. And so it's a great time to email me or Andy or Greg or um, any of the co-authors and say, hey, I've got this paper, you should include it if we miss it. And um, the only other thing I'd like to take away for people who do paleo intensity, this is just looking at the QPI in the data set. Um, there's really good, uh, um, uh, adherence to, to alteration and MD uh, checks, which makes sense. That's kind of follows our, our, our gold standard. But one of the criterions is the statistics. And the data doesn't, uh, the sites don't do an amazing job of, of meeting this criterion. And while we can't do anything as a community about the scatter of our data, it's actually really the number of specimens that go into a site mean that this, uh, that we don't, meet and it's it's the threshold is five and the median number of specimens that go into a site is about three so it's, this is just sort of a, a bit of a call to action i know how hard paleo intensity data is but without changing any of your experimental protocols or the rocks you look at or the equipment you have if we can just add one or two more specimens per site on average uh we i think we'd see an improvement in the robustness of the pint data so that's my plug. Come see the poster or just check out the website. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, I think Emily also wants to do a, a flash talk. So take it away, Emily, when you're ready. Um, hello, I'll just share my... Oh, I think uh, someone might need to stop. Uh, Richard Bonham might need to stop sharing his screen first. <laughs> Richard, I think you need to stop sharing your screen, mate. <laughs> His video is frozen. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, I wonder, can Greg. guys in Liverpool uh, close them down there? Yeah. Great. Right. Hopefully you can see that now. Not yes. yet. Oh. We can now, yeah. Now you can? Okay, cool. Um, so my name's Emily. I am a first year PhD student at St. Andrews with Will as my supervisor. Um, I am very early on in the project, so I have not done any analysis yet. So this is kind of just a poster explaining what I hope to do as part of the PhD. Um, if anyone has any wisdom or advice or anything that they'd like to offer up, um, I will very much stick around during the poster session to hear anything. So there's three things that I'd like to cover as part of my PhD project. Um, the first will be looking at the Younger Giant Dyke Complex, which is in South Greenland. Uh, these are dikes that are up to 800 meters wide and have these interesting pods of layered rocks um, within them. So a group of master's students went out a couple years ago and studied some of these pods over here and here. That was Lot and Rory and a couple others, and they are actually giving talks later today. Um, so I'm hoping to 
uh, collect some AMS data from a pod over here to kind of add to their study on the emplacement mechanisms of these dikes and why we see the layering that we see. And then the other two parts of the PhD project, I would like to focus on Illamousac, which is a layered intrusion just to the east of the dikes. Um, and for one part of that, I'd be interested in looking at the layering mechanisms of why it is a layered intrusion. And then for the last part, I am interested in looking at any magmatic faulting that's occurred within the intrusion and identifying uh, any potential sill structures within it. So kind of using rock mag to identify these things and coming up with uh, systems for doing that. So if anyone has any experience with that, uh, I would really love to hear your thoughts on it in the poster room. And that is it from me. Let's see if I can stop sharing my screen now. Um, Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, if Tobias wants to do his one too. Let's see. Take it away when you're ready, up to us. So yeah, I guess you can see the screen, right? Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is just a summary of my posters. Took out some of the most intriguing figures out, and the, the title of my poster is "Can Field Dependent Out of Phase AMS." Uh, and it's to magnetic system really help to decipher magnetic subfabrics. So, uh, I mean, this poster has come about because uh, I've been analyzing a lot of subfabrics in samples during the last couple of years here. And I can pick up subfabrics with other methods, such as looking at shape of fabrics and distribution of uh, magnetic minerals or shape of magnetic minerals. Uh, but I couldn't really see the fabric with uh, out of phase AMS, which you can analyze at the University of St. Andrews with the KLA5 Kappa bridge. But there have been uh, previous studies saying that you could potentially see a uh, kind of uh, small vortex state uh, pseudo single domain grains with the help of uh, out of phase AMS. So we were basically wondering if, if uh, the settings, the instrument settings that we use uh, for measuring out of phase AMS were, were uh, accurate for capturing this kind of pseudo single domain fabrics. So uh, I basically done a field dependent out of phase AMS study, and we have some interesting results. Uh, so in fields below 100 uh, AM uh, and fields between 107 and AM, 700 AM, we get basically inverse, magnetically inverse fabrics in some samples. So this is a trachea on the site, uh, looking at out of phase AMS. We also get uh, completely distinct fabrics uh, looking at, or we get distinct fabrics looking at the uh, uh, lower versus the higher uh, low fields of out of phase AMS in a Gabro from Sweden. So this is just basically some of the initial results from our studies. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to do any magnetic experiments due to the flooding of our lab here in St. Andrews. But hopefully we will be set up soon again and I can do some magnetic experiments trying to characterize the magnetic particles more. But yeah, come and see my posters for the initial results. It's quite interesting if you're interested in, in using out-of-phase AMS and AMS in general. Yeah, thank you.